Dan is a longtime friend of mine. We actually met here learning sign language when uh, we were teenagers. when we were teenagers is when we met. And I'm not going to tell you the exact year, but it was uh, when we were teenagers. Uh, Dan and I have a lot in common. We were bo both born here in Rochester, grew up here in Rochester. We both came to RIT to learn sign language. Dan regularly attended class. I regularly attended parties. That's one difference we have. Now, often the person who introduces the speaker um, will give a brief summary of the person's personal and professional life. However, Dan's presentation is going to include all of that information. So I will not need to share that today. I've known him for so long. I've watched his career for quite a long time, his enthusiasm, his passion, his skill, his knowledge. He's the, his respect for the deaf community, his involvement in the deaf community. It's truly inspiring. I work with interpreting students, um, providing tutoring services and whatnot. And I've been doing that for quite a long time. And if students were to ask me who they should look to as an interpreter role model and a person to emulate, I would say that Dan would be one of those people. I am honored and privileged to introduce my colleague and friend, Dan Veltri. This place here, NTID, changed my life, truly. And it's changed for the better because I've come here. I want to first say thank you to Sarah, Todd, and Danny, our three interpreters, as well as tech for today's series. This is what I'm going to be talking about today. what it looks like growing up and my involvement in the deaf community. In the summer that changed my life, I'll get more to, to that soon. In my years here at RIT and NTID, then my move to San Francisco, California, interpreting in the Bay Area and beyond, and discovering video production and founding of my company. My company is Treehouse Video. I also work as a freelance interpreter uh, and videographer. And what influenced me thus far in my career and life? As I look at myself, I feel like I'm no different than any of the other hearing folks who were also here with me at RIT at that time. I didn't plan to become a part of the deaf community. I simply came to RIT as a person who happened to be curious about the deaf community and ASL, and then fell in love with the community and eventually became a part of it. And that's not just my story, that's our story. All right, let's start with my family. That first photo there is of me and my husband, Ron, and all of my family is hearing. I've got two older sisters. Both are here in the audience today, sitting right here in the center. And in the picture, I'm actually a baby there, <laughs> right there in the center in the Christmas photo. The one all the way on the right in the top row, those are our parents. Both are now deceased, unfortunately, but Back in 1997, we went to a family vacation at Disney World, and that was where that picture was taken of the five of us. And we laugh and like to call ourselves the original unit, the five of us 
the original unit, before we were all married and had children. That's us, the original unit in that photo there. And this photo here, this is a photo from my, my husband Ron and I's wedding. And we both have such wonderful families who cherish and respect the love that we have for one another and they all support us fully. This is everyone um, that was there, um, even my father who was still alive at that time, he's in this photo as well. And the picture here in the bottom right is from um, my niece's wedding who was just married last year. She's also here in the audience. And I was asked to um, officiate their wedding and it was a huge honor for me to be able to do so. These are all of our current family members who are there. So now I wanna talk about my dad. His name was Carl Ventry. And he operated Veltri's shoe service. And he ran that business for over 50 years in Greece, New York. It's pretty close by. I'm sure you all know where Greece is. At the same time, he was also involved in the volunteer fire department and served as a firefighter from the time I was born, which was back in 58. And then eventually he became a firefighter for a very long time. And he was very involved as a leader and someone who did a lot of stuff in that community. It was more of a career than a business. And he was really happy to be involved and serve in the community. And that was a huge influence for me in my life. That fire department is in Barnard, which is pretty close by to Greece. There's a picture here in the lower right. It's actually located on Dewey Avenue in Greece, that fire department house. And we went pretty often. He essentially lived there. And so we eventually uh, inevitably were there a lot. And he wasn't paid for it, but it was a volunteer position and he was involved in there for many years in that fire department. And they also had an association of volunteer firefighters in the state. And he actually became the president of that organization for many years in the 80s. My dad was the one who taught me how to interact with folks, how to give and show respect and get all of the reciprocity, ethics and fairness. I learned all of that from him. I grew up on a Cloverdale Road in Greece. And this aerial shot here of the map in the top right is what the street looks like. In the 1950s, I was born in 58. Um, it didn't look like that, but at that time, um, especially as a teenager, I was in there for, I was there for most of my life. And there were so many kids the same age as us you all know boomers, right? We were always out in the streets causing mischief and getting up. As soon as we got up in the morning, we'd go out and play on the streets. And you can see a few photos of us. And these pictures here, you can see some folks from my dad's side. And then our deaf neighbors, Frank Simo, you can see if we were able to zoom in on the, the aerial shot here, what the houses looked like right next to each other. Frank's wife, Elva, also had three kids hearing children as well. One was Dorothy, David, and Deanna. Dorothy actually worked here at NTID. She taught in the math learning center back in the day, I believe in the eighties to whenever that time was when I had left Rochester and we never crossed paths, unfortunately, while I lived here. Anyway, that was Dorothy. And the three of them were older than me and my sisters. They were sort of our babysitters. And look at how close our houses were to one another. Back then, we didn't have any TTYs, interpreters, anything. And so I think 
um, we had a phone and Dorothy was a teenager. I'll, I'll, they had a phone and they would tell other folks our phone, phone number to the world. And then what we, we would do is our phone would ring, we'd answer it and they say, hi, this is for the SEMO residents. And we would all fight over who would go and deliver the message to the SEMOs. And so we'd ring the doorbell. They actually had a flashing doorbell. And Elva, who was a lovely, lovely woman, a beautiful woman, would open the door and give us a hug and give us um, cookies. And she taught me how to fingerspell um, stuff, such as my name. And we did lots of lots of gestures. We would often forget to give them the message because we were so wrapped up in all the other things. But that's what life was like when we're young, you know. I always had a really good relationship with deaf people. I never pitied them. I always felt that um, deaf folks are equals and that they just felt like my aunts and uncles. And I never really signed with them. We would gesture, point to things and just try and figure out how to communicate. And maybe that's because both of our families are Italian. I don't know. When I was in high school, I got into music. I played piano and we had a piano at home. I didn't take any lessons. My sister did, but I did not. I would just listen to her play and try to figure it out. I really loved rock and roll. Remember, this is the 60s and 70s. I eventually got involved with a church youth group at St. Charles Church in Greece. All the other kids in the group were about the same age as me and played music as well. We would perform for each other and thought that it might be a good idea to start a band. We called ourselves Sunshine. Now, remember that name. It's going to come up again in a little bit. We were popular. We didn't expect it to take off as much as it did, but people would book us for weddings, banquets, any kind of party. We were busy every weekend. I was a junior in high school. This was 1975, but we just, every Friday and Saturday, were out playing with the band and earning money. Now I got to my senior year, and I really liked science, so I thought I might do something with that for college, but I didn't want to give up my band, and I couldn't afford college on my own. So I decided to stay in Rochester to be in the band and go to school. I eventually chose RIT and majored in medical technology. I don't know if it's an Italian thing or not, but my family really wanted me to go into healthcare. They wanted me to be a doctor. Okay, got to do what the parents want. I did like science, so it was an okay fit anyway. So I chose the med tech program at RIT and started my college career here. I was a commuting student for my freshman year. I lived at home with my parents. My first time at RIT. Back then, there was no internet or computer. Remember, this is the 1976. The business office had a computer, but the rest of the world didn't. We had to use phones and letters. That's how everyone did business back then. So I got to campus to register for my classes in person. I was standing in line in a building that's in the middle of campus. There's a ramp leading up to the building. We used to call it the CU. I'm not sure what it's called now. It's called the SAU, folks in the audience are telling me. Great. So back then we would wait in line outside that building to register for classes. While I was waiting, there was a woman walking through the line, signing, asking if there were any deaf students there and that they needed to go over with her. So she was speaking and signing at the same time. I now know that that's Kathy Gillies. That was the first interpreter that I saw at RIT. She was hearing, she could sign, and she wasn't my neighbor. I know that deaf people can sign. No one told me. I wanted to go home and say, hey, you didn't tell me that there were other deaf people out there. <laughs> 
At the time, NTID wasn't involved with the community. So people didn't know that there were sign language classes. I didn't even know that NTID was here and no one shared that with me. This was the first time I realized that NTID was here in Rochester and that people were using sign here at RIT. All of my classes were biomedical type classes for my major. And there were deaf students in my classes, maybe three or four. I would watch their interpreter in class. I was that hearing student I know who was just sitting in the class watching the interpreter and the deaf people would ask me what I was doing. I'm like, no, no, I'm not doing anything. I'm sorry. But I was always keeping my eye on what was going on. I wanted to learn sign, but I was intimidated. One day in the CU building or the SAU building, I was in the basement. There was some column in the building that people put posters and announcements and notices on. And one of the flyers was handwritten. <laughs> it looks like someone just put it up there one day. And it was an advertisement for a manual communication class. It was a free course in the mornings, meeting in the cafeteria at 8 a.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I went there and it ended up that my teacher was Rachel Rose. I heard a rumor that she might be here today. Rachel was my first ASL teacher. She taught me basic fingerspelling and sign. At that time, we just had a list of vocabulary and she would tell us, just talk with your hands. Okay, easy for me to do. I learned fingerspelling and other basic sign language. I eventually got up my nerves to talk to some deaf people and I started making deaf friends. There was a chemistry teacher named Ed Kane. At the time, I'm not sure if anyone knows him. He's retired, I don't know where he's at now, but he used English and sign language at the same time, sim coming in the classroom for every lecture. As a deaf student, that's great because you get direct communication in sign language with your professor. And I know the students really appreciated that. I know there's some politics around using both languages at the same time, but as a hearing person, the teacher had to speak slower while he was signing. So for me, it was much more clear. The professor noticed that I was interacting a lot with the deaf students. So towards the end of the year, I wanna say it was in 97 or 79, sorry, 1977. And he told me about a BITP program, basic interpreter training program and asked if I would be interested because he noticed I was always with the deaf students. I found it, it was free, so let's go. <laughs> no tuition, nothing extra. And I got a chance to live in the dorms. So I moved out of my house. I got to live on campus and I was 17. So that was thrilling for me. I know, sorry, I just turned 18 at the time. And you could drink in New York at 18. They later upped the drinking age to 21, but at the time we could drink. This picture you see here is my BITP cohort. A lot of the people you see in this photo are still in the deaf community. Almost 45 years later, they're still working with the deaf community in some way. There is a picture that's missing, shoot. The picture that's missing showed our teacher, Anna witter Matthew. And Alice Beardsley. Anna and Alice were our fearless leaders. We also had five deaf teachers. It was overall just an incredible experience. From 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. for 10 weeks in the summer, we worked tirelessly to train. We were not allowed to speak in those classrooms. We could only use sign language. It was a fully immersive experience. And those people changed my life that summer. That fall after the program, I was hired as an interpreter at RIT. We were called student interpreters at that time because we were full-time students at RIT. I was still in the med tech program 
and there was no interpreting degree yet. They didn't even have official sign language classes at RIT. There was a program for interpreters. NTID faculty like Sam Holcomb offered sign language classes, but they weren't for anybody on campus to take. It was just kind of like a free university at night. The teachers weren't trained. They just made it up on the spot, tried to figure out how to teach us. They didn't have a curriculum. There wasn't any licensure or anything like that back then. You can see in the middle photo here, I volunteered myself for the free university. <laughs> As a hearing person was teaching other hearing people sign language, though I have learned my lesson and know that that is not the way to go, I will now refer people to deaf people to teach them. The bottom left picture was fall of 1978 or 79. I was an RA in the dorms on the 12th floor, 12 North, I remember. Mac in the middle of the picture is Ellie Rosenfeld, of whom this room is named for. She passed away after battling cancer. It was very unfortunate, but she was a critical leader to us at school. She was a hearing woman, but provided a strong space for deaf and hearing students to work and be together. This group was about half deaf and half hearing who were RAs in the dorm at the time. Ellie is the woman, the woman sitting next to Ellie is Nancy Rourke. I forget what her last name was before she got married, but that's Nancy Rourke, a famous deaf artist in our group of RAs. And so our teacher, Anna, wasn't just our teacher. And we didn't have any sort of access services back there, but she realized we needed interpreters so much. And so I, I guess they thought that the people who founded NTID perhaps thought, oh, the deaf folks will stay here in LPJ. They don't have to go over to the other side of campus. But all of them eventually moved up in the university and because they wanted more education. And there weren't enough interpreters at that time. And they were just training as many as possible to make sure that they had some people sitting in the classrooms interpreting for those poor deaf students. And I, unfortunately for them, got one of those jobs. And I was in a biology class not knowing any of the vocabulary. Luckily, I was a science major and had taken science classes. And so I knew some of the material and some of the context that they were talking about, but my sign language was not up to par yet. And I remember the first deaf student that I worked with, he was staring at me and he had this look on his face that he could not understand what was going on. And so I started adding more to my interpretation and adding a few things and expanding. And I had a supervisor come one day and said, you just violated the code of ethics. They didn't, you didn't sign what they were saying. You were adding all these other things. You got to follow the code of ethics. And so at that time I thought, okay, this is something I need to internalize and learn. I, at that point, because we didn't have much formal training, didn't know how to really process the language into one another and translate that stuff, not just following it word for word. So we needed it back then, but we didn't have it. And I remember very vividly back in those old days, like every number of weeks or so, we had in-service trainings. And that here working at RIT was essentially my true interpreter training during my senior year at RIT. We would train with Anna and talk about the different ways to interpret things, different sign choices, and just what sort of ethical decisions we should be making when we're working with deaf folks. So eventually I moved to San Francisco, but how did that happen? Oh, well, there's another story as well, briefly. So remember Sunshine? I told you all to remember that word, right? That was our band. Anna knew that I was in the band at that time. And so one time I was in the interpreting office and she was like, hey, come over here. You're in a band, right? Would you mind helping us out? We're trying to do a fundraiser to earn some money for the National Association for the Deaf and the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. And so we had 
a group of deaf and hearing signers who also were able to perform the lyrics. And so we had that and we called it Sunshine Loves Simple Things. And we performed at the EET, I believe it's called Panera Theater now, over in LBJ. And we performed there with our music and people signing our lyrics. And it was a big hit. People began reaching out to Anna all the time, saying that they wanted to have us at their conferences and whatnot. But we were, were like, no, we're just a hearing band. We can't do that. And so we kept the name Sunshine. And over the years, there were many iterations. There were Sunshine 2, T-O-O. And then I think it's called Sunshine 2.0 now. Um, but that name Sunshine comes from our band. So yeah, I don't know if folks know that story, but there it is. Now you know. And so back to San Francisco. By the time I uh, was finished with my science studies, I realized I didn't want to be a scientist. I wanted to work with deaf folks, period. And so I thought, oh, maybe teaching is a safe choice. And so I never really considered interpreting as a career. I didn't have a role model for that. Of course, there were some here at RIT, but out in the world, I wanted something more. And so I worked with my science advisor over at RIT, and I decided to work towards an education degree and started shifting my track that way. By the time I graduated, I was getting closer to my graduation in 1980. I'd also worked with some of the science support team members some of the folks who assisted students in tutoring and whatnot in STEM areas. And that summer in 1980, the University of Rochester made a joint specialist program for deaf people in education. And I thought that was perfect. And so I made sure I got my application mater materials together and they offered me a full scholarship in their program, which was very shocking. Remember, I was 22 at this time, and I didn't really know what graduate school was all about. And, you know, that was really um, a major point for me. People at U of R also, back in that summer of 1980, said that you'd have to take a few more additional classes like psych and other things that um, RET students weren't required to take. And I thought, okay, that's fine with me. So I took some of those classes, and I remember at that time, the folks in my cohort, um, they were the people who were, we went through graduate school together with, and none of them were hearing, none of them knew sign language. And it was interesting because they were all uh, people who used spoken English and um, advocated that stuff. And so I don't blame the school at that time. It was the olden days. People didn't know that that sign language was really the golden standard. And this was back in the 80s everything was uh, following a heavy speech, emphasis on speech. So I decided to leave the program upset by this discovery. And at the same time, I met many folks from California who came to the BITP program in 1980. And so all of those folks were hearing but could sign. And I asked, oh, how'd you guys sign? And they said, um, our teacher, Mabs Holcomb, um, taught them how to sign and how to get involved in the deaf community, go to deaf schools and whatnot. And at that time, I, um, I, I'm currently gay, I'm out, but at that time I was still discovering that um, for myself. And I was in the twenties, I thought I uh, was ready to drop everything in my car and drive to California. These are some of the folks who were major influences on me. Ellie, Ken, Sherry, these folks here, the bottom left. And they, these were some of the people who were instrumental in teaching ASL the right way. Not just signing words and whatnot, but actually learning real, real grammar in ASL. Some of these folks, um, MJ Bienvenu, Betty Kalonymous, the people who were teaching us deaf culture because we didn't have access to that at that time. And since then, people have taken their workshops and that has spread far and wide. These are some of my early experiences as an interpreter. We had deaf artists, performers on stage, and we actually had to interpret their 
performances into spoken English. And there were many important folks in the deaf world at that time. All these strong CODA interpreters, CODAs, children of deaf adults, they were all in the Bay Area at that time. And they were a huge influence on me at that time and really essentially adopted me into their group and helped me um, grow my experiences through the years. This is Dan Lehortz, and this was an AIDS workshop. This was during the AIDS crisis that really hit our community hard. Many deaf leaders uh, were gay themselves and many gay interpreters as well. It's really interesting that any deaf memorial that happens from AIDS often includes interpreters as well, which is really touching and shows how close our communities were to one another. So I wanted to make sure I pointed that out for you all today. Leo Jacobs, who wrote this book here on the screen, A Deaf Adult Speaks Out, he wrote this um, a while back. He talked about the experience deaf folks experienced in the classroom of people just using spoken English to them. Here today at RIT and NTID, obviously people use sign language, but back then they didn't care. They just would speak to deaf people. And then if a deaf person you know, decided or asked about sign language, they might say, oh, signing is painful for me. But what was our thinking back then? I, I just don't understand. But Leo Jacobs wrote this and I read this and I realized from this point on that people who work in deaf schools must sign from now on. And he invited me as one of his interpreters actually as he toured South America and that was a three-week tour. We were essentially roommates. There were a lot of folks who didn't know each other. We were basically on the American Express, and we shared hotel rooms. Our beds were right one, next to one another. And he taught me so much during those three weeks and helped me acknowledge my autism. I'm not sure if you know it, autism is. It's the belief that deaf people are missing out on something and need to be fixed. And as hearing people, we all have that. And so for me to confront that and actually address some of the stereotypes that I have in my brain, I had to acknowledge it, toss it, and work through that autism that I had growing up. And so I worked in a mental health clinic for the deaf, UC Center on Deafness, UCCD. And that center was part of a hospital system, a psychiatric hospital system. They had services for the deaf community as well as, um, and there were deaf and hearing folks who worked there. And Dan, Dan Langhorts also worked there and I was there as an interpreter. And I noticed they had a closet filled with videotape equipment and no one was using it. It was just left there collecting dust. And one of the doctors, I guess, did research on sign language and that was um, Dr. Suchlester, Alex Suchlester. And he, it's an old famous name uh, in the mental health deaf world but they were one of the first doctors to say that sign language was not bad for deaf people you know she wasn't an advocate either but at the same time um, people had always said that sign language was bad and that deaf people should not be doing that and so for an md a medical doctor to say that sign language was fine was a big deal and so she got a lot of money from the state of california to establish this clinic and keep it running for some of her research she filmed deaf people over um, a longitudinal study and followed them for many years and showed that sign language was natural for them. And all the things that um, people were saying negatively about deaf people and learning sign language was untrue. And then after that research, the video equipment was just left in the closet. And so I was going through that stuff at one point. And Dan was saying, oh, well, we've got to get out to um, a workshop 
and um, do all these things. And I wanted to make a video of him. And so that was in the 80s and the beginning of VHS becoming more widespread and whatnot. And then eventually that's how I got into um, video production. Luckily, who was running the center supported me heavily throughout that time. You might be wondering why I chose the name Treehouse. See the picture of the circle here? That's the treehouse, or the picture on the top right with a circle. In 1984, I applied to rent that apartment, and in, that's not easy in San Francisco. It's very competitive. There was no internet at that time, too. So I had to go to the office, look at a paper listing, and it had showing times. So, of course, there were a bunch of people there and I was one of 50 some odd people who wanted that beautiful apartment. You can see the view. Look at that. And it was pretty cheap for the rent. Everyone there obviously wanted the apartment. I dressed up nicely. I had my check ready to go. And the man who owned the apartment was an English professor he gave everybody in the room a blank piece of paper and said, please write a little bit about why you should live here, why you want to live here. An essay? Okay. I wrote, I'm a sign language interpreter. And he immediately picked me because of sign language. I stood out differently than all of the other hearing people who were in the room trying to get that apartment. And I was the lucky one. He would always say, you're living in my tree house. So that's why eventually when I established my business, I gave it that name. In the 1980s, the deaf world changed. Schools went through a change where they used bilingual, bicultural education now, but back then they didn't have as much sign language. They tried to include some English, but it wasn't working. So they just defaulted to using sign language in education. But deaf education as bilingual can be done the same way that Spanish and English bilingual education is done. So everybody in the schools uses sign language and then they teach English using sign language to learn reading and writing. I was lucky enough to work at UCCD and they had federal money for research with bilingual approaches to deaf education. He was hearing and didn't use sign language, so he took me with him when he would go to the schools for the deaf. I worked with Marlon Kuntz, which we called, whom we called Lon. Lon was a leader in all of the efforts to change residential schools for the deaf. I had a master's degree and he went to school for a PhD at Stanford University. The chair invited him to study in a special research lab for bilingual education under the Stanford School for Education. Not deaf education, special education, but bilingual education. He was interviewed, it, he interviewed me, and it was the first time that as an interpreter, I'd ever been interviewed by a deaf person. That's very rare for the deaf person to get to interview the interpreters. So from getting full support from him and the administration, they brought me in. And we worked on linguistics, education, and deafness. And I, by that time, UCCD funding that had supported my previous position ran out. So I was full-time 93 on. So jumping ahead to what I'm doing now, I'm working in tech, I'm in the Bay Area. One deaf man I work with often is really cool. His name is Sam Seppa. 
I am the oldest interpreter of all of the interpreters on our team. So one day I asked him, why do you want me, an old guy? And his answer was, I like the good old workhorse interpreters. Okay, I don't know if that's a compliment. From all the way to the BITP, all of the people who were with us at that time, thank you, you old workhorse interpreters. And thanks, NTID. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Um, it's fascinating to hear your story about living in Rochester and um, people's journeys. So it's interesting how people often leave and come back to Rochester. Do you envision yourself staying in the Bay Area or do you think you might come back to your family in Rochester in the next 10 years? By now, I am in California. My husband's family is there. But luckily, I see my family often. My family's here in the room. I don't know if folks notice that. My sisters are here. We see each other every year. I come home every year. I've seen my nieces and nephews grow up. I'm involved in my family. Thank goodness for airplanes. They, for a while, thought Uncle Dan lived in the airport or I drove an airplane or something. I was always traveling. So I'm in California, but I am still very close and connected with my family. So someone from Zoom, um, her name is Carmela Cochran. Uh, she couldn't be here today, but uh, she is asking her question through Zoom. And she says, um, I'm extremely proud of you, Dan. That SVP picture, I was actually in the front of that picture. And I wanted to thank you for everything you've done for the deaf community. It's just been fantastic. Now there's another comment from Linda Koopman, who just said that they remember you um, and remember you or being a participant in Dr. Ed Kane's class. So I don't know if you were in the same class together or, or what. And uh, Linda's very last comment was, wow. Um, another person says that they just loved that you um, shared your story and that they have really good memories of that time, um, that they had formerly lived in the Bay Area they have experience working with you at USF. And we actually knew the same people in the Bay Area. You are a legend. Oh, thank you. Oh. Now there's a comment from Megan McTammany. That's my niece. She says, um, I'm so proud of my uncle Danny. I love you so much. Thank you, Dan. So for future interpreters, current interpreting students, do you have any words of wisdom for them that you'd like to share? I know it's the same old story from deaf people after generations and generations. Do you think the interpreting skill is more important or the attitude is more important? It's always the attitude. How you feel about deaf people. Do you have deaf people in your life? And outside of interpreting, if there are deaf people in your circle that you care about, can you understand their culture? What are you doing as a person to support the deaf community's goals? Keep that in your heart and in your mind. That's my advice for you. All right, here is um, another comment from Dr. Janice Cole. She says um, she loves how you have shared stories from the 70s and 80s and brings fond memories. She says, so glad the audience had the opportunity to see who you are and how you represent our deaf community. She thanks you. And thanks you again for being a wonderful ally. One last thing 
I didn't do any of this alone. Deaf people, and in some situations, not just helped me, but forced me. (laughs) Of course, this is from deaf people. Deaf people are ready. I was ready to connect with them and they took me in and taught me everything I know. I was just at the right place at the right time to soak it all in. Thank you so much, Dan, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. I, I don't know what to say. I'm just, thank you. <laughs>